Hello. Hmm. To pee or not to pee? <laughs> That's not a question. It's not a question. The P in the sentence that I spoke before stands for precision, as in the invention of Clarence Leonidas Fender precision bass. Come with me. Hey folks. Welcome once again to another Luthier's Layer Live. Uh, my name is Gary Denyer, and I'm going to be taking you on a wild journey through history today, which is going to be really good fun. <laughs> yes, it is. It concerns the progenitor base, the de facto base, the workhorse base, the jack-of-all-trades bass, the one that we all know and love, the Fender Precision Bass. I think it deserves a bit more of a, a, a cheer than a golf clap, don't you? But yeah, the subject today is going to be um, Leo Fender's absolutely, oh sorry, itchy face. <laughs> Leo's fantastic invention, the Fender Precision Bass, something that totally revolutionised music back in the day and has is still a stalwart of today. Amazing, amazing bass guitar. Now, how are we going to go about this? Well, first off, I would like to say hello to Phil. Almost there. Yes, that's correct. That was the line I was playing there. Yes. That's right, Phil. Well done. Well recognised. Awful. Lahom, my good friend, and Scott Whitley as well as with us today, folks. Great to see Scott. Great to see Laurent. Thanks very much for joining me. Um, this is going to be a, like a brief history of time, not in a Stephen Hawking voice, of course. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a brief history of. Uh, mainly concentrating on the P bass, but uh, a little bit about Leo uh, Fender as well, I would assume. Well, we'll see what we get to. I'm just winging this from my knowledge, so... <laughs> you know. 
It's always good fun. Yeah, look, if you're here and if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, uh, the bear that I have here gets very annoyed, you know. So my advice to you, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please just smash that subscribe button. Ring the little bell there so you get notifications of any time that I put up new content, stuff like that. And there's a huge back catalogue going back to 2006 when I used to record with a potato. <laughs> All the way back then, and I was much bigger then because I kept fit and now I'm completely knackered, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. Please, it helps us out. Give me a thumbs up if you like what's on here. Give me a thumbs down. I don't, that's, that's fine. It's not a problem. Uh, if you have any specific comments not in the uh, live chat, then you can leave uh, comments in the comments section below and I will try my best to address them going forward. Okay? So, let's get on with it. Yes. So, let me give you the backstory on this. This is m sort of my interpretation of a P-Base, okay? This is one I, this one I built for myself. I built an identical one for a customer recently who's uh, surprisingly very happy with it. Because, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you know, uh, a lot of people said it was sacrilege to put um, active pickups. And this is... An active base. Why did they do that? It was to show you the um, battery compartment in the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was for, you know. And I, the the strap nearly fell off, and I really goofed that up. And it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my interpretation of it. We're going to go through the actual design and the philosophy uh, that um, Leo Fender had in mind. You know, Leo was uh, Leo was born Clarence Leonidas Fender. Yes, a lot of people kind of don't know that, but that's fine. Quick uh, shifty on Wikipedia will tell you that. And uh, Leo, at an early age, uh, really liked to tinker about with the electronics and find out how things worked, stuff like that. It was very ingenious. You know. I would really like to do a podcast as well about um, how Leo thought. When Leo was young, he actually lost an eye and he had to get the eye removed and uh, he had a glass eye put in. So this is a guy with one eye who performed mir miracles. He really did in the design of not just bass guitars, but any electronic guitar. He was just a phenomenal guy. Um, he even started the radio station, I believe, uh, probably in the late 30s, early 40s. He was born in 1909, so it was a long time. He died in 1991. Uh, he had a long and storied life, uh, performed and accomplished more things than, than a lot of people would ever do in their lives. Um, so... He was a genius. I'm going to have a look at the chat here. Back in time. Yeah, that's right. Hey, Paul. Glad you can join me. Even though you're sitting downstairs right now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm glad my internet connection can handle more than one stream. It's good to have Paul here. He will be uh, probably featuring in, in future podcasts. But we'll wait and see about that. So... Let's get on to what Leo did. Uh, I think it was about 1950. 1950, um, Mr. Fender um, put forth a design. Now, the only um, schematic design I could find of a P-Base was from 1952, I believe. And I'm going to show you that right now. Here's Leo's sketch. It's not really a technical drawing at all. There's no measurements on it or stuff. Isn't that fantastic? Look at that. There's the full pit guard and stuff there and the whole design beautifully written up and you can see there Clarence L. Fender. Okay. And then 
there's a lawyer's signature down there because, hey, we all need lawyers, don't we? <laughs> Indeed, yes, yes. What a shame. Again, smash that subscribe button. <laughs> Sorry, I left that video on in OBS. I should switch it off. I don't want to spam you, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, those were kind of the early days. But here's the rundown on it, okay? The rundown on the P-Bass. This beautiful instrument that... Um, really revolutionized electronic bass. It's certainly true, okay? It's certainly true that the innovative electric guitars produced by Fender, you know, throughout the 50s, the Telecaster, 1951, and the Stratocaster, 1954, the Stratocaster. Yeah. 1954. I'll come back to the Stratocaster in a minute. Plus the Jazzmaster in 1958, if anyone can remember that. I can't because I was minus 10 years old at the time. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, th this kind of changed the shape and the way that music was created and experienced back then. Uh, also, um, Fender uh, produced amplifiers back then which was also a revolution because, you know, you had bands back then were kind of acoustic. You had upright basses with scales like 48 and 60 inches and stuff and upright basses. And they couldn't produce, as bands got louder and louder, they couldn't produce the volume that you needed to um, accompany, say, drums and stuff like that. So this was a real big revolution. And that's why the, the precision bass first produced to the masses in October 1951. 1951 was such a special um, instrument. Um, you know, if, if Leo didn't remember anything else, it, it would, if he's not remembered by anything else, surely it's going to be the P-Bass, you know, surely. You not think? I think so. Uh, a, a completely revolution, a complete revolution in in any instrument, really, to to try and emulate an upright bass. That was amazing. It just didn't exist before he in, invented it. Um, that ensures his place in history, and I'm sure you know everyone realizes that. I can't say enough about Leo Fender. Amazing, amazing guy. It profoundly affected music from then on. The first uh, commercial unit, as I said, was available to the masses in October 1951. 1951. Now, bear in mind, <coughs> this is uh, my interpretation of the facts, right? <laughs> <coughs> as such, there may be errors, but please feel free to explore this history. It's very rich. And it really does give you an, an essence of what it was like to be on the cutting edge back then as a pioneer, you know. The thing, here's, here's the comparison that I'm going to make. Uh, Leo earlier that year had uh, brought out the Fender Telecaster, the Telecaster, which had the, the round part here. It had one cutout, had one horn, as they're called, horn. Horn <laughs> on the guitar, you know, and Leo went with the two cutouts the upper horn and the lower horn here. Now, this kind of affected balance in a good way, you know, you don't have this mass here. Now, I do the same thing with my scarab, I have just one the horn on the scarab, but I've shaped the body of the scarab so that the balance is very good. But Leo thought, okay. I'm going to even things out, put two horns on the guitar, two cutouts there in the body. This provided, like I said, greater balance, greater um, ap attitude on the bass. The way it sits on your body and stuff like that, and the contours of the body that you put in there, 
like you saw in the diagram that I produced, uh, that I showed you earlier on. I think that's still active. Let me see. Uh, there we go. As you see there, there's the double cutout. So, fantastic from Leo there. Good design philosophy. I thought that was amazing for him to do that. Good thinking. Now, the neck. The original P-Base neck was a one-piece maple neck. Um, necks nowadays usually are composites. You know, you have, it's usually maple. It's so stable, close-grained, tight wood that uh, con constitutes a neck. And then you will slap on top a piece of, like, ebony, rosewood, palfero, oak. Very hard woods like that that are resilient, so they do. that can withstand hours and hours and thousands of hours of abuse. Basically, let's 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 <laughs> let's face it, right? That's a lot of abuse. Uh, but the original P base was one piece, did not have a piece sandwiched on top of it. Now, how did the Fender Precision Bass get its name? This is really funny, actually. Well, I think it's funny. You may think it's absolutely crap, but... <laughs> I think it's quite funny. Precision came from the, uh, the edict that he fretted the bass. Therefore, it was more precise. <laughs> Sorry, I, I went p there, didn't I? To get a note, you had frets, so you knew precisely, precisely where to put your fingers. Uh, basses back then were mainly uprights, of course, and uh, fretless, of course. So it didn't require that uh, degree of skill that you need to get perfect intonation when you're playing. Hence the name precision bass that was it that's it really <laughs> no look it up it really was that really was the reason he called it a precision bass I, I'm still flabbergasted by it and uh, let's actually let's bring up a, a picture of the vintage custom here this is from uh, Fender's own site there it is. That was the very first stylization of the precision bass, as you can see there. It really is a remarkable piece of work. 1951, this bass was first made. I'm just going to go back to describing some of the stuff, and we'll go back to that picture in a little minute to show you what I mean by it. It's because my skill with OBS isn't as good as everyone else, you know, so. <laughs> Sorry, that's the broadcasting software I use. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take a quick break and say, and uh, look at the comments here. Yeah, Monk Montgomery. I'm going to mention, actually, a lot of famous uh, PBS players. Um, just to name a few in a little while. Uh, Laurent says, what's funny is that the first fretless Fender bass was a precision and not the jazz bass. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Yes, that's right. And for good reason. I think Leo hit the nail on the head with the design of the precision bass as opposed to the jazz bass. But the jazz bass is still just a phenomenal instrument and uh, also very reliable. And I'm going to get into how utilitarian... Uh, that's a big word. <laughs> How utilitarian the P bass really is, you know. But let me finish running down the specs of the first one. The first one, as you saw, had the full black pick guard and a single coil pickup, much nearer the neck. Not here, but it was like about here, single coil, you know. Uh, the body was string through. Uh, sorry, the. The strings went through the bridge and through the body at the back like a Stratocaster, actually, which I'm going to allude to in a minute. It went right through, 
anchored at the back of the body. Amazing. Really quite revolutionary. And that gave it such a great break angle. And, uh, you know, it would have been very bright if they had the modern strings that we have nowadays. But what uh, Leo did was he put a plate on top of the bridge. Now, the bridge had two saddles in it. Not, not uh, four saddles, I can't count. <laughs> not four saddles, had two saddles, so there was problems with intonation and stuff, and the, the, the saddles were made of a pressed fibre type material, and each saddle um, was able to con contain two strings. So you had two strings each saddle, and they moved back and forward, much as sort of this one does. This has got a high mass bridge on it, and that's the way I make my P basses. I'm sorry, I'm just a snob. <laughs> but I do, I do. I really believe in it. I really do. I really do. I really do. <laughs> yeah, so that was the bridge, and what happened was he had put a plate on top of the bridge and a plate on top of the pickup. The pickup plate uh, es escapes me design-wise. But the reason for the bridge plate, or ashtray, as it's commonly called, was the ashtray had foam on the inside of it, which when you attached it, um, and it was removable, you know, but when you attached it, it would mute the strings, muffle the strings, so you'd get a, it'd be like a... That sort of thing, you know, with uh, the stuff. Yeah, it wasn't even worth a clap. But never mind. <laughs> you get that sound with it. So it would be, it would sound like a, a fretless sort of, you know, uh, an upright bass. Um, that was the reason for the foam inside the ashtray cover. And I can show you a picture of the ashtray cover if you didn't remember from the last time. And it is there. See that? And on the inside of that, near the bridge, was a piece of foam. piece of foam right there. And that would mute the strings. Another clever thinker there. Some, you get modern ones that will clamp down, but uh, I prefer to use the heel of my hand to get that sound. And, you know, it's just a good technique because you can mute all strings or some strings and stuff like that, the way that the, you roll your hand across the bridge. Bad thing about the P bass is it used grub screws for string height, you know. And if you lay your hands across the bridge, that's going to tear the skin off your hands, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It's fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, that was the vintage model, you know. Now, the truss rod, of course, was, I believe, adjustable at the neck. Yeah, I'm just checking a, excuse me, lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was adjustable at the neck. There. There. Yeah. So, um, some jazz basses now are adjustable at the heel, but that's by the by. That was the original design. The, the tuning heads, the tuning heads on the bass were made by, I think it was Cluson. That's K-L-U-S-O-N, Cluson Tuners, uh, back in the day in 1950, 1951. Let me, let me fact check that. Yes, I was right. Yes. Yeah, and uh, it borrowed, the P-Bass borrowed several features from the Telecaster, the actual electric guitar that Leo had made earlier that year. 
including the headstock shape, uh, the neck plate, plate sorry, the uh, truss rod uh, design, uh, potentiometers, of course, which were two domed chrome um, knobs, knurled knobs, and in the original P base, it had a, like a plate, like a jazz base does, you know, like a chrome plate, and then the pick guard covered the upper part of the body. Which, you know, people don't seem to realise that. Um, kind of strange looking now, because we're all used to the modern look of the P base. But I think <coughs> the most, because this was really the first proper electric base, the most innovative thing that Leo did was he made, after much consideration, he made the scale length 34 inches. 34. <laughs> I don't know why he did that. He just did. And it became a de facto standard. Now, now you'll get Rickenbacker doing 33, 32 and a half, stuff like that. You'll get... You know, Lembeck doing their thirties. Uh, you'll get uh, even Fender themselves. Um, the little uh, mini P base down there doing a twenty-eight point six inch scale length. But Leo figured that that was a good compromise from weight, the way the base feels on you, because he produced the first body in ash, which is quite quite heavy. It's porous, but it's quite heavy and and pine as well believe it or not, like I said. Um, but he believed that length to be a good compromise between the ring of the string and between what people were playing as uprights at the time. So I think that was a, a real stroke of genius. He, he really did, did his research, understood the ergonomics as much as the mechanics of, um, of a bass. And there became the first P bass. The vintage colour, of course. I can show you in this one. This is a nice picture here. Look at that. And there there you can see the bridge. The bridge there with the um the hokey uh <laughs> two saddle bridge <laughs> and the single coil pickup with four magnet poles in it. The uh chrome panel for the controls and the full upper body pick guard there just fantastic design I think anyway I thought it was fantastic when I first saw it I really did so that's the vintage 1951 P-Base now we're going to go into a bit more uh, progression of how the P-Base sort of evolved but talking about vintage Something really weird happened to me the other week. <laughs> yes, I heard a story that chilled my very blood. <laughs> this week's edition of, wait for it, well, this person that I'm going to talk about is a, is a crazy person and uh, should not be taken at face value. And there's a disclaimer here. Is it a f fictitious character? I don't know if it is. Is it? <laughs> but we should take a break now to realise the accomplishment in this week's Luthier's Lair tales of the really weird... Angus Torag, luthier and crap bass player, had always been a bit of an odd bob. But his latest obsession took the biscuit. His obsession was to build a crap bass guitar that he was convinced would bring Elvis Presley back from the dead. But the end result was a barely functional instrument that looked like it had been put together by a madman. <laughs> Torag was convinced that Elvis would be resurrected with it. He would stay up all night long 
strumming away on his instrument and singing Elvis songs. His neighbours complained about the noise, but Torag didn't care. One night, Torag's obsession reached a fever pitch. He was playing his bass guitar and singing at the top of his lungs. Suddenly, there was a flash of light and Elvis Presley appeared in the room. Torag was ecstatic. He had actually done it. He had brought Elvis back from the dead. But Elvis was not happy. He was enraged that Torag had disturbed his rest. He grabbed the bass guitar and snapped it in two. Torag was devastated. Elvis then delivered a vicious beating to Torag before disappearing back into the afterlife. Torag was left bloody and broken, his dream of bringing Elvis back from the dead in shatters. Poor Angus. I mean, he's trying his best, for God's sake, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, if there's one thing that's going to make you immortal, it's getting a foot in the face from Elvis Presley, right? That superb black belt from yesteryear. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, with that said, talking about vintage, vintage, and moving on, okay, actually I'm going to have a little, uh, uh, Robert Lamb says, what bass is that you're using? Lammy, this is my own take on P bass, and I'm going to explain that pretty soon, I really am, believe me. Yeah, 1971 P bass fretless, a fantastic vintage. I would agree, Phil. Lahon says, I had never realised until recently how the sound of the Mustang bass is similar to the Precision. Yes, very similar, very similar, very similar um, design philosophy as well. I might add, and I may do a piece on that. The Mustangs are very. Uh, well, uh, I believe it's a uh, short scale, a 30 inch, I believe, the Mustang. And very comfortable to play. Um, Laurent further says, the urge for a Fender bass was 32. You were 32? Man, yeah. The first bass I played was a, a P bass copy, actually. It was the first one. I was back in 1982. 1982 was my first bass. That's 40 years ago. Oh, my God. Yeah, Phil, Louis Johnson, yeah, played P bass along with his Stingray. So he stuck with Leo again. That's a brilliant story uh, with Leo branching off, being disgusted at the way his own company was going and, and making Stingrays in 1975, I believe, was the first uh, Musicman Stingray, I think. Check that out for me, guys. Yeah, that's really weird. Yeah. Monk, monk, glory. Yep, that's right. So, yeah, let's let's go through the evolution of the P bass. As you can see now, this is a very modern take on the P bass. Now, let me see if I have a picture of what we expect the P bass to be now. I think I do. I should have one. Let's see. There you go. There's one right there. On the web. This here. This is uh, what we usually expect from a P bass. See the pick guard covers a lot of the upper part of the body and goes wraps round. And that's uh, very similar to what I have here in my own take on the P bass. And that's the way it evolved. As you can see, the pickups are now split coil. It's a split. It's one pickup, but it's a split coil pickup. They're connected in series, but they are reverse wound. So what does that mean? This one's 
wound that way and this one's wound that way. <laughs> That's what it means. The reverse wound. Why did that happen? Well, electronically. Um, what you get from a coil when you pluck a string is it induces a current in the coils. So with the split coil, reversing the polarity of each coil, or reversing the windings, sorry, I should say, because it's alternating current of each coil, cancels noise. It's just the way electronics works, and that's the inductance uh, part of it. So they moved, the single coil was noisy, of course. You know, you would plug it into a fender amp back in the day and you get, you know, Marty McFly and Back to the Future and all that and stuff. <laughs> Talking to Marty, who played a Stratocaster. Do you know the first Stratocaster was made in 1954? The P-Base was made in 1951. Can you see the similarities? Yeah. A lot of the Stratocaster design was based on the P-Base. That's true. It really is true. It is. It's true. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, that's what happened, actually. They, uh, they f furthered that, and then, you know, the Telecaster was the first one. But the Stratocaster was uh, kind of an offshoot of the design philosophy behind the P-Base. And now the Stratocaster is the de facto standard in electric guitars. The P-Base is still still nowadays the biggest selling type design type of bass in the world why is that well um p basses are relatively simple for a passive one uh active ones i don't know people think it's sacrilege <laughs> but uh you know a passive p bass has a volume and a tone a split coil pickup. It's one pickup, really. Uh, two coils connected in series, which makes makes it one pickup. Um, that's it. The body is, has this beautifully ergonomic design. Belly carved in the back, of course. If you've got a big belly. Mm. <laughs> and uh, usually a 20 fret neck. Usually. Scale length is 34 inches. It's a, it's, it's a sm simple design and it goes with Leo's philosophy that a well-designed instrument is easy to repair. That's a great philosophy, but, you know, some people push the envelope. Uh, myself included, of course. <laughs> Sometimes it's not easy to repair, but that's a great philosophy to stand by. It really is. Now... As the P-Bass evolved through times in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the zero zeros, or whatever you call that, the 2000s, 2010, 2020, right up to modern day, the P-Bass still ranks as the top design adopted by bass players. One, like I said, is affordability. Two, is it's kind of ergonomics and balance. I mean, let's run through some of the players that have played P basses. Um, if I can find the list I made, I don't know if I've lost it. Or not. You have, uh, people might not know these guys, but I'm going to run through it. Um, let me have a look. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, the, I tried to... Um, Scott says, lovely bass. Thank you. Yeah. What I tried to do was emulate the blonde color, and I couldn't quite get it. Uh, it's probably the huge amount of polyurethane I've put on top of this. But, you know, <laughs> I was in hospital for 10 weeks because of that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's no harm on this. Talk. This is active as well. There's no harm. No harm on this. Um <laughs> And the split coil, I think, Phil, yes, yeah, Phil, you're talking about split coil. Yeah, it reduces the harm. It's like noise cancelling. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. 
some players here, some famous P-Base players. Now, n- not all of you might know this. I know we're having people from all around the world here, but I just want to mention guys like Jet Harris, who was who was the bass player for The Shadows, if you remember that, Cliff Richard and The Shadows. No? Do you remember them? Yeah. That sort of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the great James Jamerson. Yes. Geddy Lee, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Geddy. Geddy loves P basses. Uh, Monk Montgomery. I think, actually, Phil said that. Monk Mon- Montgomery. Yeah. William. William Montgomery. Bill Montgomery. Um, Lionel Hampton band he used to play them you have John Shifty Henry he used to play um, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys yeah I remember the Beach Boys oh yeah and of course recently inducted Hall of Famer Carol Kay what a pioneer that woman is unbelievable if you haven't listened to Carol Kay's stuff, go and listen to it. And Susie Quattro as well. You have uh, the late, great John Entwistle. He was actually much more famous for his buzzard stuff later on in his life, but uh, 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 my generation, he... he initially played My Generation Live, that superb bass solo that I won't even attempt to play. Um, he did it on a P bass to start with. Unbelievable. Uh, Donald Dunn, Donald Duck Dunn, remember? Yes. Booker T and the MGs. Yeah. Uh, Didi Ramon of the Ramones. Awesome. Sting. Sting, actually, wait a minute. You know what Sting with the police did this one. He had this. So each time you had Roxanne. Roxanne. No, I'm not going to start that now. Yeah, yeah. Sting played one of them. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, so uh, back to the list here that I've lost. <laughs> Lots of tremendous players, you know. We have uh, Bruce Foxton, actually, uh, of the Jam, started with a P bass, and then he went on to those... Um, God, help me out, Scott, here. Scott, um... Yeah, same with live engineers, Scott says. Sound engineers, love them. Oh, you've got to love them. (laughs) You know why? Because if you don't, they'll screw up your mix. (laughs) Intentionally, on stage, live, they will do it. Yeah, oh, yes, they will do it. Yeah, Bruce Foxton started with a P bass and went on to, um, it was like a Gretsch type bass, I can't remember. It was like a bigger version of a Hofner Club. So, something I can't remember the name of the bass. Oh my God, that's terrible. See, getting old is not for everyone, you know. <laughs> it isn't. And we had like Paul Simmons of The Clash. Um, Simmonson, sorry. God, here's my brain. Uh, Tony Franklin. Uh, Duff McKagan as well, Guns N' Roses. He used to uh, use a P bass. And, uh, of course, Nate Mendel of the Foo, Fi- uh, the Foo Fighters. <laughs> Nate Mendel, a P-Bass aficionado. So, uh, why, why is this? I mean, why is this? Can we reiterate this? Like, the scale length of a normal P-Bass is 34 inches. And I believe that is one of the reasons it was adopted way back then in the day. I think it was so... 
just the balance that Leo got with it and everything was just so... Just fantastic balance and everything. And it's very versatile. You, know, you can play any style on it. I think, um, actually, when I was talking to uh, Laurent, he had said to me that it's a pick-up-and-go bass, and it really is. You can do anything on it. And, oh, here's a big comment from Scott. Another testament to how popular the P bass is. Many studio engineers and producers, yes, insist that you use a P bass. Yeah, yeah. It became such a standard that they know exactly how to get an EQ and compress them. Yeah, it's so standardized that many, many sound engineers and studios, you're right, did demand them because they knew exactly how to engineer the sound of them because they were so replicable. Whoa, that was a hard one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, you know, other bases were uh, so tough. I mean, you've got such a variety of active bases now with sound shaping on board that are great for live. But when you go in the studio, you want something that is completely, you can duplicate all the time, completely. And this is just for continuity. And the engineers love it. The bass player might not love it, but the engineers love it. <laughs> and you know, those are the guys who are going to make you sound really good in the end, you know. So, uh, yeah. Hats off to sound engineers, man. They have an amazing job. It's an amazing job they have, but they do ama an amazing job as well, which is uh, very, very um, important to an overall sound in any track or any song or any tune that you would like to do. Um, Fantastic. I totally agree with that. Lahon says there are thousands and thousands of P bass aficionados around the world. Yes, indeed. Um, and th it's not a surprise to me. It was, it's the original bass guitar, really. It really is. It's, um, yeah, yeah. Bigger cheer than that, I think. <laughs> Scott, yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyway, I think the second factor, when it came along, the P-Bass had a fretted fingerboard and it made it much easier for maybe even just, not just your common guy picking up a bass for the first time, but even uh, upright basses to get a handle on it, you know, just to precisely play each note, whereas that's where the precision moniker came in. That's actually how they named the bass. I said at the start, you know, you had uh, things like the uh, the companies uh, like AudioVox, stuff like that, would produce uh, the electric bass fiddle and stuff like that, but nothing would come close to the P, P bass at the time. There was really no competition. It was because of the, it was fretted, it's balance, everything. It was just amazing. And, of course, there's P bass influers. Inf influers? That's nerves for you, uh, influencers out there. Uh, you know, Fender sales, they wasted no time in promoting this, and they were absolutely exemplary in the promotion of their latest invention. And that was, you know, the network that Leo had built up by then. Fruz actually had a radio station and a radio repair business. He just networked and it just got out there. So it's difficult to imagine um, a history where it would be alternative to that. Of course, the first electric guitar was made by Les Paul. I believe, I'm not quite sure on that, but the first popular one was Les Paul in 1941 of Gibson fame. And uh, from there, I, mean, I think Leo really got a handle on everything and took everything to the next level after that. That's what inspired him and his love for electronics, his love for music 
And, you know, this is a guy who had to have an eye removed because of a tumour at a very early age. It just shows you what you can do. And I will always tip my hat to Leo. Just the man, the man, when it comes to it. Yeah. Scott says, yeah, for the record, being the awkward git that I am, I would never use one. Sorry, that was funny. <laughs> okay, here's my take on the P bass. Um, I made this one recently, about two months ago. For myself, I'd made an absolute duplicate of this just before that for a customer. And what they had said was, I would like a P bass. I said, awesome. Easy build, man. Easy. <laughs> they said, no, I want a P bass with active electronics, but just volume and tone. Uh, I want the modern pit guard layout. I want an LED neck with 22 frets in it and a hybrid uh, Telecaster jazz bass headstock. And you see, I haven't even inscribed this one yet. You know, because I don't know what to call it. <laughs> so I did, I did it actually. I did inscribe the customer's one. It's called the PB1-T. The gas base, PB1-T. What does that stand for? Well, PB is P base. One for the first uh, model of its kind. And dash T is dash tribute because it's a tribute to Leo Fender. And that went off somewhere. I can't remember where, but they have it now. So, that's my take on the P-Base. It's got 22 frets, this one. LED dot inlays. Just because, you know, if you're in the dark, sometimes you need to know where to put your fingers. Don't take that the wrong way, folks. I have on this one, actually this morning, this had uh, 40s to 105s on it. And my hands couldn't take it because I'm a weakling. So I put 30s to 90s on it to just show you, you know, it's, it's very versatile. If I could do some familiar tunes, you know, like... A Tune, tune, and then that's just finger style and I turn down the tone on that and you can go beautiful sound nice deep rich sound you can get out of it you want to slap yeah Sorry, showing my age there, eh? Never mind that. So, it, it's, that's, I think there was, La Holland that was uh, mentioning that earlier was, uh, it was, it's so versatile. You just pick it up and you play. It might not have the precise sound you want, but, you know, as a workhorse bass, you can't go wrong with it. Cannot go wrong. And uh, <coughs> let's see what Scott's saying. Uh, are you the precision bit? If you listen to some of the old Sun sessions, yeah. Getting back to Angus there, you know. <laughs> With the upright bass on it, you'll notice 
so many of the bass notes that were literally nonsense, nowhere near on pitch. That's, I know, it's like, it's like if I was playing uh, something like, wait a minute, I'll turn down the tone for this thing. Uh, let's play nonsense love cats or something, you know. Well, that wasn't nonsense, I'm sorry, but I don't know, how do you play that wrong, you know? <laughs> Is that good? That's like Les Dawson on piano. I'm sorry for all you folks <laughs> who have never seen Les Dawson, a British comedian, play piano. If you don't, look him up on YouTube. It is a riot. A riot. Yeah. So, you know. And of course, the P bass is great for just standard. Just simple stuff. Wow, it's an awesome bass. But I do want to uh, to finish off today by giving you uh, something on. I, I converted my mini P, uh, as you probably saw, into a, a tenor bass. How did I do that? Well, here's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to take off my headphones, take off this bass, get that bass, and put my headphones back on because all the leads get tangled up in a trip and fall and break my ass in the night. So, one minute. I'm coming back, honestly. That's just the way I have to do things, you know. There you go. <coughs> As you can see, it's tuned to... Uh, that's D. Uh, sorry. A, D, G, C. Okay. Tenor bass tuning. And uh, you can do. Do stuff like that on it. Snooker. But anyway, never mind. But there's, there's one tune I like to play on this, and I'm going to uh, end up today by playing this tune. And then we'll have a little chat, and then we'll all go and have a drink.
That was a rendition of uh, More Than Words by Extreme, which uh, unfortunately we used to play live back in the day, in the 80s. Actually, um, we played an Edinburgh Students Union gig. I think uh, Scott Whitley might be interested in hearing this. Um, Thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, Yeah, uh, I think it was 86 or 87. And uh, I wasn't playing the bass to that, but we had a lead guitarist that was in Edinburgh's, Edinburgh, capital city of Scotland, Students' Union gig, where a band that you might have heard of called Big Country. <laughs> yes, we're playing and we were third build. We were third on the bill and we played that. Um, 86, 87. Can't remember. We played that, and I did backing vocals back when I could sing, you know. <laughs> and uh, we had a, a fantastic lead singer, and we had an incredible uh, lead guitarist called Ryan Smith, who I've lost touch with now. He was fantastic. He could play all Prince's stuff and stuff. He was just ludicrously good at the um, electric guitar. Anyway... Um, I think that's about it for today. I, I really, really appreciate you joining me today. It was a fantastic run through history. There's so much more to this story. There's so much more to Leo's story. You know, everything to do with uh, Leo's uh, luthiery work, the guitars he came up with. He just pioneered the industry. I mean, you can say that Les Paul was a great influence, and he certainly was. Especially, you know, with the EB series basses and stuff like that. But uh, there's nothing like a P bass. Nothing like a P bass. Nothing like it. <laughs> Just the best. So, that being said, thank you very much, everyone else, for joining me. And, uh, yeah, cool story, Scott. I know, it was just cool. Just a fantastic story. And, um... Coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a big surprise. Um, actually, I have to mention my challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm overrunning here. I was challenged to make... Um, challenged to make this. So, I'm going to make one of these. I am going to make a 1951 vintage Fender Precision base um that's better yeah I'm going to take up the challenge and I'm going to make one and I'm going to document it here on YouTube you'll see the videos of me making it uh, everything authentic the blonde colour everything right down to the to the little uh, control panel so that's the challenge so I hope I'm up to it I'm telling you Okay, that'll do it for today. Once again, thank you very much for joining me, everyone. And those of you watching the rerun, thank you very much for watching. And you know what? Stay safe. Be good. And I'll catch you all the next time. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye.